We'd like to take a few minutes to give an overview of the state of automation technologies. We'll try to highlight a few areas where applications can be built today and sketch out how these tools may evolve over the near term. First, let's look at adoption. Earlier this year, we uh, did a survey which garnered over 11,000 respondents. Well, we basically wanted to find out how enterprises were using machine learning. And what we found is that many companies are, in fact, still in the early stages of adoption. Uh, and we also found that the, one of the main things holding companies back is lack of skilled people or a skills gap. Uh, the good news is that developers have taken heed in this growth in demand in our own online learning platform, Safari, which has over 2.1 million subscribers. We are seeing a strong growth in usage in all topics related to AI and machine learning. So, for example, you can see here uh, double-digit growth in uh, people reading about TensorFlow. But we are also seeing... Uh, really strong growth in new tools and topics, including PyTorch and reinforcement learning, both of which were uh, subjects of tutorials yesterday. Now, a recent survey of close to 4,000 IT leaders across 84 countries found that more and more companies are, no surprise, starting to invest in AI and automation technologies. Uh, but the level of investment really depends on the company. Uh, and in, in particular, the companies that already consider themselves to be digital leaders tend to report a much higher level of investment in AI and machine learning. Location matters too. Given the highly competitive business environment in China, we're seeing that companies there also tend to invest at a much higher clip. So recent progress in AI and machine learning has been fueled by growth in data, compute, and models. So let's briefly examine each of these elements. So let's look at deep learning. So the resurgence in deep learning happened around 2011, 2012, with uh, record-setting models in speech and computer vision. Uh, in fact, when I first began following the deep learning community in 2013, that community was still relatively small you actually had to uh, do an internship in a few groups scattered across the world. A lot of the knowledge was in the form of oral tradition. Today, that community is much, much larger. Now, progress in research has been made possible by a few things, namely the steady improvement in data sets, but also uh, hardware and software tools. Um, specifically, easy to use open source libraries for machine learning have really leveled the playing field. These uh, open source ML libraries have made it possible for even non-expert developers to build interesting applications. And in fact, last year in 2017, we featured a couple of teenagers at our US AI conferences uh, where they were self-taught and they were able to build potentially high-impact uh, prototypes involving deep learning. So now companies have taken notice, and uh, a lot of them now want to really start getting serious and building and deploying ML and AI systems into their products. In 2015, LinkedIn conducted a survey in the U.S., and they found that there was, at that time at least, a surplus of data scientists. Today, that's no longer the case. Demand for data scientists in key metropolitan areas in the U.S. is very high, and we believe, actually, this will continue to spread to other industries and other geographies in the future. With that said, having great models isn't sufficient. At least for now, many of the models we rely on, including deep learning and reinforcement learning, are extremely data hungry. Now, since they, since, uh, they have the potential to scale to many, many users, the large companies in the large countries ha seemingly have an advantage over the rest of us. For example, China in particular has been dubbed the Saudi Arabia of data. That's right. And because AI research depends so heavily on access to large data sets, we're seeing more and more cutting-edge research coming out of large U.S. and Chinese companies. NIPS, for example, as some of you might know or remember, used to be a bit of a sleepy academic conference, but now it sells out within minutes. And we're seeing more and more papers coming from these large U.S. and Chinese companies. The good news is that there are many new tools that might help re the rest of us gain uh, more access to more data. Namely, services for generating labeled data sets are increasingly using AI technologies. The ones that rely on human labelers are beginning to use machine learning tools to help 
their human workers scale and improve accuracy. And in certain domains, exciting new tools like GANs and simulation platforms are able to provide realistic synthetic data, which can be used for training machine learning models. Uh, we'll have a few of these uh, sessions to cover some of these topics at this conference, in fact. So definitely feel free to check it out. So this is uh, uh, generating data. Another important aspect is sharing data. And uh, my co-chair here, Roger, is going to give a great talk tomorrow about uh, the rise of new data networks for sharing. We are in uh, the seventh year of this renewed interest in AI and deep learning. And if you, fo if you follow the history of uh, computer architecture, typically you want to figure out what sort of computations you need to do and uh, decide whether or not you have enough scale. And at this point, it seems like we do have enough scale to start uh, building specialized hardware for AI and machine learning. Now, machine learning researchers are constantly exploring new algorithms. And in the case of deep learning, this usually means trying new neural network architectures, refining parameters, or exploring new optimization techniques. The challenge is that experiments can take a long time to complete, hours, days, or sometimes even weeks. But help is on the way. Numerous hardware startups are targeting deep learning, uh, both in China and the US, as well as uh, here uh, in the UK with companies like GraphCore, which will be a speaker at this event. The SF Bay Area in particular, though, uh, is a hotbed for experienced uh, hardware engineers and entrepreneurs, many of whom are working on AI-related uh, startups. And as you can see, many of the hardware startups are targeting edge devices. We know about the opportunities in model training, but the market for inference is also going to be enormous. Now, we've talked about data, models, and compute, mainly in the context of traditional performance measurements, namely optimizing machine learning or even business metrics. But the reality is that there are many other considerations. For example, in certain domains, including health and finance, systems need to be explainable. This is a real concern for many companies. And in a recent survey, we found lots of awareness and concern over these issues on the part of data scientists and data engineers. So while we can start building interesting applications today, we need to remember that uh, a lot of these machine learning models can still be brittle. So I'm sure uh, all of us have read examples of computer vision systems that seemingly fail under uh, reasonable conditions. So the thing to remember is there's actually two dimensions here, right? So there's efficiency, pr uh, efficiency provided by automation. But in certain domains, you really need to take into account reliability as well. So the founders of Mobileye described it best, right? So the main parameter in the race for autonomous cars cannot be who will have the first car on the road. Developing safe, fair, and secure AI applications will happen in stages. So you can, uh, you can look at the technologies available today. They may not get you to full automation, but uh, you can start uh, thinking about partial automation. So you need not uh, adopt an all or nothing attitude. So one of the things to remember, it's really hard to predict how these technologies will play out. In fact, uh, in Silicon Valley, where we're based, we even have a, an informal law for this called Amara's Law, uh, named after Roy Amara the co-founder of the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. And Amara's law says this, right? So we tend to overstate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. 